بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد. So we're continuing on in talking about the nine conditions for prayer, and we're talking about something very important, which has to do with tahara, purifying ourselves for the prayer. And there are so many questions, and there's so many things, Messiah, that come up. One of the things that was asked is about uh, what if the fluid, for one, number one, does this happen to males that they have uh, the and that they have to make ghusl and we also try to make it clear that yes of course that men and boys that when the boys become mature that if they become excited that they might ejaculate sperm and sperm is a white sticky fluid and it will come out very quickly and that right there they must make ghusl if that happens the boy or the man must make ghusl likewise for a woman because a woman is different than the, the men and the boys, their body is different, and sometimes for them, other fluids come out. Likewise with a boy too. If, for, for one, we, what, for example, with a boy, he may be sick. If he is sick, and something comes out uh, of his private parts, a karma law, either private part, which could be the, the bottom, or his uh, other area, Akramakumallah. Either one. If something comes out, for example, if he bleeds, some people are sick and blood comes out. Blood comes out of, they could have hemorrhoids, comes out of their body, their bottom, or the other area. They could be sick. If they are sick and it's blood, this person uh, has the uh, hukum of istihada, uh, istihada for the woman, of course. But this means that this blood has to do with sickness, so what they should do is they should clean this blood, clean them, you know, hopefully it finishes, clean it and make wudu. They don't have to make ghusl. As long as it is not uh, sperm from ejaculation or menstruation blood from a woman having her period, or a woman having her baby, this blood as well, which is called nifas, if it is those types, that's the major hadith, you must make ghusl when that's finished, clean and ghusl. But if it is some other blood, a blood is, you're outside of your period, and this is very intricate, we're going to have to do this on another time, intricate, giving you intricate uh, these Messiah about the Haid and Haid and Nifas and Istihada. Those are very in depth, and this is not the time to talk about in deep, but we'll, in depth, but we'll just give you some of these basic Messiah. So if uh, a woman, she is bleeding and it's not in her time of her period, and she normally has her period every month on the seventh, for example, and for example, it lasts seven days. If it goes one month, it goes into eight, nine days, then. That is not her adha, that is not her habit, so she will then, after seven days, she will ghusl, and those extra two days, she just has to clean herself and make wudu, and she prays. Because that blood is not considered haith. That is considered istihava. So that's different, that's considered kind of like a sickness. Likewise, the boy that he, for example, some people get all kind of different diseases. Uh, maybe they have something that causes pus to come out, that karma come along. You know what pus is? Pus is very nasty stuff, like if you get a very, something, some infection on your skin or something, and it becomes very infected. Pus is a sign of infection. It's usually white. If pus comes out of your private parts, of karma come along, because you're very sick or something, then that you would wash your private parts and you would pray. Yeah, you would make a wudu, just wudu. But you don't have to make ghusl for that. Okay? The ghusl is for those other things. So I hope that's clear and that covers some of those important uh, issues with regards to that condition for, for prayer. So this is the removal of hadith. And we mentioned that there's hadith al-akbar or hadith al-asgar. That's a condition for prayer that you, you cannot pray with this, and as we said, the Prophet said, 
that Allah does not accept the prayer of any one of you without purification until he makes wudu. So you have to purify yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and, and that was one of the evidences for that. The fifth condition for prayer, for salat, is the removal of impurities from three. Meaning that you have to purify your body. So it means you have to have wudu or you have to have ghusl, depending on what hadith you had to remove. You also have to have, uh, your clothing has to be clean for salat. So, uh, and also the place you pray has to be clean. What does it mean clean clothes? Doesn't mean that your clothes were dirty and they kind of smell, no. Even though it's better to have, you want to smell good. But, you must, uh, we already talked about the body, but the uh, clothing, for example, what if that stuff that we talked about, the sperm or something, is dried on your clothes? You should try to clean it. Maybe some of it got on your clothes or something, or you were sleeping and it happened or whatever. You need, you need to clean that from your clothes. Or for the woman, if her blood, her menstruation blood, got on her clothes, she should clean that. But if there is just a little bit left and it's very hard to get out, she can pray. She can pray. And there's a hadith in the Prophet ﷺ, which illustrate for us, one of the hadith is the Prophet ﷺ went to Salat, uh, and I, uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, I believe, she uh, had cleaned his garment, and there was still a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of light from, from uh, ejaculation at Kramakamala, from the sperm, it was still on his clothes, just a little bit. It, she washed it, but it didn't come out, the, the effect or something, and he prayed. So that is the deal, that's evidence that if it's something light, something a little bit, you can pray with that. Even likewise for the woman in her menstruation. If it's just a little bit, it's still left on her clothes. She couldn't get the stain out. She cleaned it. Maybe you're in a place, you live and there's no soap. There's not much soap. You're using water and it, you, you know, it's still something on your garment. You can pray if it's very light. You know, you tried your best to get it off and there's still uh, something on there. So a person's clothing should be clean for salat. And the place you pray. You cannot pray in a filthy place. Of course, you can't play, pray in the bathroom. You can't play in a, pray in a place where people have been, been using the bathroom. Okay? You cannot pray where you found those uh, roth or the, the thing from those, uh, camels. those camels. You can't pray there. But you can pray, if, if you had to pray, in a place where there's sheep and the sheep stuff was there, you could pray there. The Prophet ﷺ was asked about this, and he ﷺ said, you can because you can pray wherever the, the sheep, if the, if the animal is tahir, then that means what comes out of him, also it is, uh, you, can, you can pray there. Camel? Camel, no. Camel was mentioned specifically. So, uh, the camel was mentioned specifically in a hadith, and that's why. You have a nus that says no. But the, for example, a bird that you can eat, now it is nasty if he comes by a pigeon, for example. A pigeon is halal, or a chicken. And, akramakum Allah, you get it on your clothes, or it drops it on you. You should clean it off, or on your head. Clean it off, because it's nasty. But it's not... Uh, it is not uh, uh, impure in the sense that it would stop you from prayer. You should clean it off as much as you can, but you can pray. Okay? And that, that's the point. So, that it's very important and to, to know and understand those issues. So, that has to do with the prayer. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, And your garments purify. in Surah Al-Mudathir. And that is the real that you need to purify your, your garments. And also some of the Mufassari, they also explain that also purifying yourself from shirk, of course. Come into Tawheed and leaving off shirk. Purify yourselves from urine because verily it is the most common reason for the punishment of the grave. Very important. When you make istinja, 
uh, Mr. Who Plays With Their Mouth, please be listening, that when you clean yourself from, uh, when you clean yourself for prayer, you have to make sure that you have that stuff off your clothes. You got, you got to make sure, especially for boys, because girls usually don't splash like that. But maybe if you're outside and you're close to the earth, so that you have to always take care to be careful and make good istinja with water to make sure it doesn't get on your underwear, it doesn't get on your clothes. Because the Prophet said, or in a hadith, I think it's a hadith of Ibn Abbas, he said, the Prophet ﷺ was walking by two graves in a graveyard, and he saw he saw these graves, and they were graves. In one narration, it says they were graves of, of some Jews, and he said, "Verily, they're being punished, and they're being punished for something that is not the people don't take as a big thing." And then he said, "As for one of them, is they used to not clean themselves properly uh, when they went to the bathroom." And then he mentioned that the other person used to do namima. They used to backbite and speak evil about people and spread it in the community. He said, Emma So anyway, the shahid here, the most important thing here is that letting us know that you have to clean your clothes properly. That when you go to the bathroom, be very careful. If you know that you have, this is another mess that we got to go into. If you know that there's some urine on your clothes, but you don't know where, you know some splashed on you, then be general and clean it. You know it got on your right leg. You don't know if it was here, you don't know it was there. Then clean all of this area with water. Doesn't mean you have to soak it, but you want to make sure that you get the, the urine out. Okay, or whatever. Or if it's number two. The main thing is you want to clean it as best as you can to get with water. If you know for sure that it got on a spot, then you only have to clean that spot. And the way you clean it is with water. You can use soap, but you have to make sure that uh, the water, use water, and then you can use soap, and then use water again, or something like that, okay? And it just depends on the type of najasa, but the main thing is you wanna get rid of the najasa, because bowl, and, uh, I mean, urine, and poo are nudges. They are nudges, so you want to make sure they're off your clothes. And that is one of the reasons people get punished in the graves. That's what the Prophet ﷺ was letting us know. So we believe in the punishment of the grave. And pe some people are getting punished in their graves right now while we're speaking. Some people are having a comfortable time in their graves. And may Allah bless us to be of those who are comfortable in our graves, I mean. The sixth, the sixth condition, so I'm going to try to be quick because I know it took a long time is that you have to cover yourselves properly, cover your clothing. The covering of one's aura, any area of the body that must be covered with clothing that doesn't reveal one's shape, their skin, or complexion. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah does not accept the prayer of women who has reached the age of menstruation unless she wears a veil, meaning that she covers herself for prayer. You know, so you can't pray in pants. Although we see some women, they go to the masjid with pants, and they pray with pants only with a little scarf or a khimar only. And this, especially in, Amer in, in the West, in America, in Canada, and UK, and probably, you see people doing this. That's haram. It's not accepted. Not only that, it's not just haram, not accepted their prayer. It's almost like they're making a joke. Some women, they wear tight pants, and they're even praying. The pants, anyway, they can't pray like that. They have to wear abaya. They have to not show their shape. And it's not just showing it for men, but they have to cover themselves. That's the whole point, is you have to cover yourself. Likewise, very important, the men, they cannot wear the skinny jeans. They cannot wear shorts that do not cover their knees. Because the man's aura is from his belly button to his knee. Belly button to his knee. So it should be, that means you have to, for sure, cover over your belly button, and under your knee. Those are the wajib that you must. Anything other than that is, 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 is good and is even better. Okay? Yeah, that's if he doesn't have anything, you know, except for those 
little garments. And the woman, she must cover everything. She doesn't cover her face uh, during prayer and, um, and the hands and so forth. So then the Sheikh, he said, the people of knowledge concur that if one is able to wear clothes but prays naked instead, then his prayer is invalid. If someone prays with no clothes on, their, their salat is not accepted. However, the fuqaha, this shows you the beauty of Islam, the scholars, they've studied these issues and they also realize that some people in some lands, some remote places, some aborigines, some tribes in Africa, some, some parts of Africa, in the continent of Africa, different countries, some tribes in Australia, some tribes in many different places, they don't wear many clothes in their culture. Maybe they don't have many clothes. They have to use animal skins, whatever they kill, whatever. Those, in those situations, if you cannot find clothes, okay, and so this is just so you know, if you cannot find clothes, absolutely no clothes. I mean, you're in a place and there's no clothes. For example, if you're locked in prison and they do not, they're torturing you, they do not allow you to pray, uh, to wear clothes. Then, of course, you can pray. You can make your salat. Doesn't mean you can't make your salat. Because in that situation, you have no choice. That's a, a dorura, a necessity. So if in that kid's situation, you would pray to the best of your ability. Even if they don't give you water or nothing, and you, you can try to make tayammum, if they have you chained, you just do the best you can. You fear Allah. Allah says, et taqallah mislatatum. You fear Allah as much as you can. You just do your best. But you still have to pray. Uh, so, covering yourself is very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O children of Adam, take your adornment to every masjid. Okay? So, meaning you should, you should wear proper clothes and you should also be, uh, try to dress and be uh, smelling nice for prayer. Uh, the seventh pillar, I mean, uh, condition for salat is the dukhul al waqt, that the time for prayer. You cannot pray. Fajr, before it's time. You cannot pray Dhuhr at 10 o'clock if, if Dhuhr has not come in. Okay? You cannot pray the Salat before it's time. You cannot pray Asr until Asr comes in. So you have to pray each Salat in its time. It will not be accepted unless it is within its time. The interest of the prayer's time, the proof of this condition is taken from the Hadith of Jibreel, where he led the Prophet ﷺ in each prayer, once at the beginning of the time for each prayer, and then at the end of its time. He said, O Muhammad, the prayer is between these two times. And Allah the Almighty says, Verily the prayer is enjoined on the believers at fixed times. So you must be in the time for Salat. And the Salat time, say when we hear the Adhan, that lets us know that's the beginning of the time of that prayer. So if you prayed a little bit after that for some reason, your prayer is still in the time. As long as it is before when Asr comes in. Before the Asr prayer comes in. So you have to pray in its time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, in Surah Al-Isra, perform a salat in the midday till the darkness of the light, night. Because the prayer time Aslan is from the sun setting and the sun rising in those times. Uh, Allah says, perform salat from the midday to the darkness of the night and recite the Qur'an in the early dawn. Verily, the recit recitation of the Qur'an in the early dawn is ever witnessed by the angels. And then, the, uh, the next condition is facing the Qibla. You cannot pray facing this way. You have to pray facing the Qibla. Uh, verily, we have seen... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily we have seen the turning of your face towards the heaven. Surely we shall turn you a Qibla that shall please you. So turn your face in the direction of Masjid al-Haram. And wherever you people are, turn your faces in prayer in that direction. Wherever we are, we try to face, we face the Qibla. We face the Qibla for prayer. Okay? Very important that you pray in the correct direction. And there's so many Messiah with that, but this is not the time. We're just letting us know the, these important conditions for prayer. You must pray in the direction for prayer. And if you are on a ship, if you are traveling on an airplane, there are some different conditions as far as that. 
meaning that you have to be a traveler and you uh, you have to be a traveler in travel and it should be your not your wajib prayers but if it's your wajib prayers you should try to face the Qibla but if you don't know where you the, the Qibla is like a lot of times we're on a airplane you don't know you just pray uh, you pray the best you can maybe you have to pray in your seat a lot of times I have to pray in my seat because the airlines that I travel on maybe they don't allow me maybe there's no place to pray that's safe because I'll be blocking the exit ways and things like this so I have to pray in my seat a lot of times okay the main thing is you have to have wudu and you pray and you fear Allah as much as you can but normally it's an obligation to face the Qibla when you pray that's a condition for prayer the last condition the ninth one is your intention is that you have the intention intention it resides in the heart and its utterance is an innovation the Prophet Sallallahu said in the ma'amala bin niyad very actions are to the intentions so you have to have ikhlas ikhlas you have to pray with the intention to worship Allah alone not to show off in front of the people likewise uh, your intention where is your intention no, where is it though? It's in your heart. Good. Your intention is in your heart. So you don't have to say it on your tongue. Some people you will hear. You will hear, especially when you travel in the Muslim countries, but even we have this in the West. But in many times you'll hear a person, he'll he'll be saying, Allahu Akbar, I, or, or even maybe before his takbir, he says, I'm going to pray uh, Salatul uh, Dhuhr, uh, four rakats behind the imam, Allahu Akbar. Some people they say this. This is a bid'ah. It's not from Islam. They cannot do that. That's haram. It's haram, but that doesn't mean their prayer is not accepted. It just means that they've done an innovation. Okay? And that act they've done is rejected. And people do it out of ignorance and stuff. They don't mean harm most of the time, but it is wrong. It is muharram. It is a bid'ah. So we do not need to make your niya on your tongue. You don't have to say, I'm praying Salat al-Asr. I'm praying Salat al-Dhuhr, Allahu Akbar. La. Or even after that, even when you say Allahu Akbar, you don't say, I'm praying Salat al-Asr now behind the Imam, or I'm praying to him. No. Your intention, it's in your heart. So you have that intention already in your heart. You know it's Salat al-Dhuhr. You make that intention in your heart, and you pray. And those, those are the nine conditions. Uh... For the prayer and just so we don't forget we mentioned islam the first one sanity that your mind is together the second one the age of uh, of prayer that you're mature uh the removal of hadith that you get rid of the impurities on your body that you have wudu or ghusl uh the removal of any impurity that's on your clothes or in your place place you pray the covering of one's aura that you cover yourself when you pray properly and that the time for Salat is entered, that is the another condition. Also that you face the Qibla, you face in the direction of Mecca, of the, the, the Haram, Masjid al-Haram, that you, you, you pray in that direction. And the last one is intention, that your intention is to worship Allah alone with your prayer. And we hope that that is beneficial. We ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. If there's any questions or any questions, everybody's okay? Okay, so we will talk more in depth about this in another sitting, but just so we know, the ghusl, when you make the ghusl, the minimal ghusl, to make the ghusl shir'in, is that you wash all of your body and with some ulama, there's some differences, but this will make you safe, with tamadmad wa istanshak, meaning that you clean out your mouth and you clean out your nose. So if you go in the shower, and you uh, clean out your mouth and your nose, or you you make a ghusl, you clean your private parts first, and you clean out your mouth and nose, and you make sure water touches all your body, that's ghusl. That's sufficient. But the best is if you, and of course with your intention, uh, the best is, is if you make ghusl by, uh, of course, making your intention, going, and washing your private parts first, both, and then uh, making wudu, and then 
washing your right side and your left side of your body. That's the best because that then you've got the sunna. But the other way is sufficient. Even you can make your intention, you can go in the, in the sea. Like when we go swimming, you can jump in the sea uh, with, as some ulama say, cleaning your mouth and your nose and jump in the sea. Bismillah and make the niyyah. You've t all your body is washed, it has water on it, khalas, go out and pray. You can do that. That's ghusl as well. Okay? So that is sufficient as well. And we ask of all the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said wasn't correct was from myself and the shaitan. Wassalamu alaikum wa sallam ala Nabi Muhammad.